ladies and gentlemen, Japanese educational theorist and educator, Sensibaru Makijushi, said, and allow me to quote what he said when he talked about discussing the importance of Soka. Soka is the value creating education system. And he said, I'm driving almost to distraction by the intense desire to prevent the present situation of our children and students forced to endure the agonize of cut-off or cut-throat competition, the difficulty of getting into good schools, the examination, and the struggle for jobs after graduation. He said that 80 years ago. And that statement, I think, is still valid for many, many of us today. We're still, I believe, struggling to improve the situation for students. Global challenges in education are threatening social stability and economic progress around the world. According to a recent report from the International Labour Organization, more than 200 million are unemployed globally. Almost 74 million between the age of 15 to 24 are looking for work. And youth employment is at three times as high as their other counterparts. While, at the same time, businesses have reported that a strong, uh, that there is a shortage of skilled labor in holding, and holding back growth in industry, quite contradicting between unemployment and a need of skilled labor. So for decades, governments around the world have announced ambitious plans for higher education reform to address specific challenges facing the higher education sector. Some participants here today are sure to hold a nation at risk. The imperative for education reform report that came under the presidency of Ronald Reagan when he talked about the National Education Committee in 1983. The recommended reforms were intended to strengthen the higher education system, drive innovation and excellence, and support the government's vision to ensure a sustainable education system. Decades later, governments around the world are still struggling to meet this objective. So, ladies and gentlemen, in a world that is rapidly changing, circulating capital and the revolutionary communication technologies, together with the alignment of knowledge, and together the alignment of knowledge, and education is ever more vital for the success of societies and economies. Knowledge is replacing other sources as the main driver of economic growth, and education has increasingly become the, and I repeat, the foundation for individual prosperity and social mobility. We are living in an automate, automation age in which Robots and computers can only perform a range of routine physical work activities better and most cost effectively than humans. But they're also increasingly capable of doing thinking right now. The technology advances are therefore creating a new age in which educational expectation, skills for work, and competency are constantly having to adopt and adapt to the market. Parents, students, and businesses are now tracking the performance of ranking of university in search of a, a university which offers a stimulating environment which fosters innovation and openness and provides opportunity for career aspiration. Recent surveys have found the proportion of individuals who have 
a higher education earn through their lifetime twice as much as those who have secondary diploma. So within the context, I think there has to be some consideration for universities in their place of society that is changing. The place of universities is changing right now in society. So for decades, after the World War II, most governments expanded the role of higher education from its traditional emphasis on educating the elite for leadership roles to providing education to the masses. In recent decades, universities have been considered vital players in a global system which is increasingly driven by knowledge, information, and ideas. Now let's look to the Middle East and Africa, and we see some factors. Allow me to share a few of them. The first one is that new markets, academic institutions, are pushed push to compete for students, faculty, and resources. It's a different environment right now. Skills mismatch. There is evidence that points out to a persuasive mismatch between the skills required by the job market and those taught in universities. An increasing number of firms in the Africa and Middle East contend that inadequate labor force skills, both technical and soft, are impeding their growth and ability to hire employees. In that same region, it's evolving, the same region is evolving into knowledge-based societies where others are still moving to industry societies. So here there's a paradigm shift to knowledge-based societies. Digital education and learning, massive open digital education and, and learning they, are, they both open to massive courses using big data in education. A lot of universities around the world use this. I'm sure you all are aware of the experience of Arizona State University in the US. It's using software that analyzes students' keystrokes, computer keystrokes, and they input information to actually look at their progression, progressing in learning. And they do so to customize their learning for each student, so using the ability to respond using the mouse and the keyboard. They make tailored knowledge for those students, something we didn't hear before. So universities in the the region of Africa and the Middle East have to face head on the challenges of creating and enhancing the use of e-learning and online platforms. Despite that the World Bank reported that over the past 40 years in the region, about 16.5% of GDP was, sent, was spent on education, which is much higher than the average budget shares of education in other regions. So why is there still a problem? In the MENA region, it's facing currently a lot of development challenges. The, the region is striving to promote inclusive growth, reduce youth unemployment, and achieve the sustainable development goals. But still, we're facing the problem of do we have the right institutions, the right curriculum, and the right environment to produce, as we hear here from the, the title, students that can excel? I think that will be a question debated throughout the two days. So, it's important for businesses be able to come into this equation. Education systems perhaps are not are no longer delivering the skills that are requested 
to have for the graduate school. And maybe a new partnership between business and universities and the government is needed. I'm sure you are aware about the example in India of a company called Godorej Group. We set a goal of training one million, one million urban and rural youth in employment skills by 2020 that the company needs. So this group has a program that trains employment, trains unemployed youth that they will be hiring. That's a very different model that uh, we have today. As we heard today, the digital economy permit allows countless aspects and opportunities. It has changed a lot of the sectors, from banking to retail to energy to medical to publishing. All of these are changing those sectors. If you look at what's happening in the health sector today and how we saw from one of the slides the contact lenses uh, being used. Not only this, but you'll be able to look to an app and that app will be able to give you what kind of illnesses you have, not today, but in five years' time. That all changes the medical industry and of course it will change the education system that will support that. So changes of this magnitude requires leadership from universities to embrace the opportunity to increase the long-term success of the graduates. The evidence suggests innovation in business and industry requires further development in our region. The World Bank report states that the region evolution appears stagnant compared to the increase observed in other regions or countries such as China, Thailand, and Vietnam. So while we need to embrace the knowledge economy, we need also to reflect that in the region's universities and the teaching. We have heard today that Bahrain is already taking action on that, but I'm talking about the overall region in the Middle East and Africa. A lot of work still needs to be done. There has been many visions in different countries, many economic visions, initiatives on innovation policies, and work to support uh, innovation for greater prosperity of its people. So, starts has begun, but the challenge is, can it continue and at what pace? The United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is one of the most ambitious and important global agreements in recent history. A recent guide for higher education institutions discussed how universities can strengthen public engagement and participation in addressing the SDGs. I would urge our universities to take the lead in this transformation and to draw up strategic plans to institutionalize their contribution to the achievement of SDGs. A lot of investment from countries and companies is going into the sustainable development goals. And universities should actually be able to attract some of that and not only to prepare students to implement the SDGs and participate in them, but also to take funds and research. I have seen a lot of research now coming up lately to address the different targets of, of the SDGs, the 169 targets of the SDGs, and universities uh, are in place to be able to, to look into that. So, if, if I allow me to ask that universities should be considering providing more innovation, more entrepreneurship program, and adopt curriculum where possible uh, to align it with the SDGs. The higher education landscape is undergoing significant change as a result of the technology innovations. We heard today about e-learning and how education is being provided to students. But I believe it is more important to see more of these programs and the integration of new tools to 
complement by many more for the online uh, learning opportunities. It's also very important for government to, su to support this initiative because they are a driver, of course, of the economy by setting the quality. And the private sector has a big role to play in terms not only of investment in universities or, the or in the qualification of young graduates, but also to have innovation models, innovation hubs, innovation labs, uh, because this is the way for the future where the teaching will be focusing on problem solving rather than memorizing. So the private sector has a big role to play to be able to provide either on-the-job training or to provide funds to create those investment lab and investment hubs. And it's very important that this happens today. As Benjamin Franklin said, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. I would like to conclude by saying I believe that we are able to achieve a breakthrough for universities' excellence in all its forms through innovation, partnership, and hard work. And I heard today public-private partnership. I heard today partnering with universities in the UK. And I'm sure there are many other success stories that we can learn from. We at the United Nations are pleased to collaborate and provide our support and encouragement, our engagement, to help deliver on the recommendations of this conference once we have them after two days of deliberation. So I tried to share with you some of the thoughts that uh, I had and allow me to conclude with a story I personally uh, was exposed to. I'm a graduate of University of Massachusetts in the US many, many years ago. And I had a teacher, his name was Don De Groot, he's a Canadian teacher who came from MIT. And uh, I'm originally Egyptian, so I did my undergrad in Egypt. And the whole education system, when I went to the United States at that time, was very different. And Don De Groot was going for his tenureship at the university. So I'm sure professors understand the concept of, of, of tenureship. And I took two courses with him. Uh, and the first course, I got an A minus. And I went up to him and I said, why did you give me an A minus? He told me, my standard was not good enough. And that really shocked my mind. And I said, what do you mean? He said, look, I come from MIT, and we have a standard, and we have, I apply that standard to everybody. But I told him, I am in the University of Massachusetts. Why do you use the standard in a, of MIT at UMass? Although they are an hour and a half different between where I was and where he was. And he said, no, standards are meant to be kept. You have to aspire and work hard to achieve the standard. So my next course, I worked harder, and I, I get an A in my next course. And I was very happy to have that A. But the story goes further. Five years later, I was employed at the UN, and I received an email from the university saying that I have been nominated to comment and give a recommendation on his performance as part of graduate students of the university who are selected to give comments on, on his performance. And, and that comments would actually either make him part to get the tenureship or not, among many other factors. So I thought, should I give him an A minus or should I give him an A? Now, I had my chance also. But I learned that standards are very important to keep. And he was right, you have to work hard to achieve it. Of course, I gave him an A+, plus, and he is now the tenure at the University of Massachusetts. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.